The Voice of America presents Forum, the arts and sciences in mid-century America. Today, as the last in a series of 17 talks on the philosophy of science, Forum presents a well-known member of the faculty of the University of California, Professor Paul Feyerabend, who will speak to us on problems of microphysics. Professor Feyerabend was born in Vienna and was educated there and at Uppsala, London, and Weimar universities. He has taught at the University of Bristol, England, and was research fellow at the University of Minnesota. His interests lie in the fields of fine arts and history, as well as philosophy. He holds membership in numerous learned societies here and abroad. And now, Professor Feyerabend. It is frequently assumed that the development of physics consists of long periods of success, which are interrupted by short periods of crisis. Successful periods are dominated either by a single theory or by a few theories which complement each other. These theories are used for the explanation of known observational facts and for the prediction of new facts. Attempts to explain a particular fact may be difficult and require great ingenuity. Still, there will be little doubt that the theory is correct and that the difficulty will one day be overcome. Difficulties, therefore, are not regarded as being of any fundamental importance. Professor Kuhn, who in his recent book, The Structure of Scientific Evolutions, has investigated the matter in some detail, expresses this attitude by calling them puzzles and not problems. A puzzle may need great mental effort in order to be solved. However, it does not necessitate the revision of basic theory. Periods of crisis have a very different character. The optimism characterizing the successful periods has gone. Problems have turned up which seem to indicate that a basic change is needed. Numerous suggestions are made. Many different theories are proposed, investigated, abandoned. Whereas the most conspicuous characteristic of a successful period of scientific research, or of a normal period, as it has been called more recently, is the fact that a single point of view is used and strictly adhered to, a crisis leads to the emergence of a great many theories. Normal science is monistic, crises are pluralistic. This factual account of the history of the sciences is almost always supplemented, at least implicitly, by an evaluation. According to this evaluation, normal science is desirable and crises or revolutions are undesirable. Of course, a crisis leads to the discovery of fundamental weaknesses in the accepted theories and it therefore precipitates progress to new and better theories. It leads to improvement, but first of all, it is only regarded as a stage in a process leading to improvement and normal science to know and normal science. The latter is still the aim. Secondly, it is often added that a crisis would not have occurred had the previous theories been formulated with due circumspection. In short, it is believed that science is essentially normal science. Crises are embarrassments, periods of confusion, which should be passed through as quickly as possible and which should not be unduly extended. The general aversion towards periods of crisis has a marked influence upon what one would call the ethics of a scientific community. It also influences the appointed court historians of this community, namely the historians of science. Let me deal with the latter first. Historians of science are usually intent on stretching any successful period of normal scientific activity until it almost covers the whole of the history of science, from the so-called scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries up to about 1900. To present the revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries as a crisis is regarded as quite legitimate. This, after all, was the emergence of science from myth and metaphysics. Nor is it possible to overlook the fundamental character of the more recent changes brought about by the discovery of the quantum of action. But the period in between these two dates is usually represented as a period of continued success, as a period when more and more known facts are subject to treatment by the theories and where more and more new facts are discovered. The effect of a predilection for a theoretical monism upon the community of scientists is perhaps even more pronounced. Any procedure which decreases the impact of existing difficulties is welcome. Any procedure which increases this impact and which suggests that the difficulty completely undermines the received opinion is frowned upon. 
Radical methods are used against those engaging in such subversive activity. It is of course no longer possible to eliminate opponents by recourse to violence. However, they are still silenced most effectively by the refusal to publish their work or else by the refusal to take such work seriously. Some of the most extraordinary thinkers, and I am thinking here for example of Ludwig Boltzmann, had to suffer from this unwillingness of the scientific community to change the delicate balance between difficulties and successes which characterizes a normal period. Of course, this conserv conservatism is not the whole story. There exists hardly another domain of knowledge that is as full of daring innovations and of unusual ideas as is science. Yet the conservatism must not be overlooked as it will influence the official doctrine and will thereby contribute to the manner in which existing difficulties are evaluated. This has an immediate application to our topic, which is the problem of contemporary microphysical theory. The history of the quantum theory is one of the most interesting and least explored periods of the history of science. It is a marvelous example of the way in which philosophical speculation, empirical research, and mathematical ingenuity can jointly contribute to the development of physical theory. In order properly to understand its interpretation, we must give a short account of the history of science from about 1600 until now. Of course, this account will have to be very, very superficial. Yet I do hope that it will give some insight into principles which today are regarded as fundamental elements of the scientific method. We can distinguish three periods. The first period is dominated by the Aristotelian philosophy. This philosophy contained a highly sophisticated physics, which in its turn was based upon a somewhat radical empiricism. The Aristotelians at the time of Galileo are still being described by many historians as empty-headed dogmatists, and the real force of the arguments against the motion of the Earth, as well as the difficulties which these arguments created for the heliocentric system are hardly ever properly appreciated. The second period is the classical physics of Galileo, Newton, Faraday, Maxwell. This is one of the most curious periods in the history of knowledge. The official philosophy is still empiricism, and indeed a very militant empiricism. Speculation is discouraged, hypotheses are frowned upon, experimentation and derivation from observational results is regarded as the only legitimate manner of obtaining knowledge. The domain of factual knowledge is considerably extended. The theories based upon this new material belong to the most subtle inventions of the human mind. At the same time, they seem to fit perfectly to the empiricist ideal. Most of them seem to have been obtained by a strict mathematical derivation from experience. We know now, mainly through the work of Duhem, Einstein and Popper, that none of these alleged derivations is valid, that the defended theories go beyond existing observational results, and that they are also inconsistent with them. We therefore witnessed here the astonishing spectacle of men who invent new and bold theories, who believe that the theories are nothing but a reflection of observable facts, who support this belief by a procedure which is apparently a deduction from observations, who in this way deceive both themselves and their contemporaries and make them think that the empirical philosophy has been strictly adhered to. We have here a period of schizophrenia characterized by a complete break between philosophical theory and scientific practice. This is an age when the scientist does one thing and insists that he is doing and must do quite a different thing. To be sure, there are very few people who were aware of the difference between the philosophical ideal and the actual practice. Berkeley and Hume are examples. But the success of classical physics was taken to expose their arguments as an exhibition of typical philosophical sophistry. This period of schizophrenia is terminated by the crisis connected with the invention of the theory of relativity and the discovery of the quantum of action. It is hardly possible to overestimate the shock created by these changes. For almost 250 years, one had believed that one was in possession of the correct method, that one had applied this method properly, and that one had in this way obtained valuable and trustworthy knowledge. It was, of course, necessary now and then to revise a theory or a point of view, but such events were regarded as being of minor importance or were perhaps even completely neglected. It now turned out that one had all the time based one's inquiry upon the wrong foundations. It is interesting to see how scientists reacted to this discovery. 
Einstein drew what I think to be the correct conclusion. Science is incompatible with the empirical method, or at least uh, with the empirical method as it was envisaged by many classical physicists. A scientist intuitively invents theories which always go far beyond experience and which are therefore vulnerable by future considerations. The breakdown of a theory or of a general point of view is not an indication of faulty method. Its possibility is essential to science. Einstein also quite explicitly broke with the tradition of presenting a new theory as a result of a deduction from facts. His first paper on relativity, zu elektrodynamik bewegte Körper, does not start with the enunciation of facts, but of principles, such as the principle of the constancy of the velocity of light in all inertial systems. The development leading to the quantum theory was based upon a very different philosophy. To start with, there was a period of experimentation when hardly any fundamental law remained unchallenged. Every student of physics was trained in the art of overthrowing basic laws, writes the philosopher Hugo Dingler about this period, which Dingler himself disliked very much. The investigations carried out during this period, mainly under the guidance of Bohr, led then to a curious result. There existed classical laws which remained strictly valid on the macrophysical domain. This suggested that classical physics, though surely not adequate, was still not completely incorrect. It seemed to contain a factual core which had to be freed from non-factual trappings. This suspicion was reinforced by the inclination of most physicists to retain the classical empiricism as the correct scientific method. The breakdown of classical physics now proved to them that this empiricism had not been properly applied, or, to put it in a different words, it proved to them that classical physics was physics only in part. It contained metaphysical constituents. Combining this philosophical conviction with a factual discovery of classical laws which were still strictly valid, they set out one, to give an account of all the valuable parts of classical physics, two, to add to this account the features dependent on the quantum of action, and three, to find a coherent formal apparatus for the presentation of both one and two. The principle of correspondence was used for the purpose to discover the parts of this formalism and was later replaced by the method of quantization, which transforms its more intuitive content into a mechanical procedure. It is most important to realize that a theory obtained in the fashion just indicated is very different from universal theories such as, for example, Einstein's theory of relativity. The concepts of Einstein's theory can be applied to the world without qualification. They are relational concepts, true. But the relations asserted to hold are objective and independent of the specific experimental arrangement used for ascertaining their presence. The theory of relativity is therefore accessible to a realistic interpretation, which turns it into a description of the objective relational features of the world we live in, a description that is correct whether or not experiments are actually carried out. The new quantum theory that was envisaged by Bohr and by his followers could not be a theory of this kind. For though its descriptive concepts are still those of classical physics, they have been stripped of what might be regarded as the metaphysical trappings. Thus, originally a concept such as the concept of position was considered universally applicable. Classical particles always have some well-defined position. Now, the conceptual spring cleaning connected with the attempt to uncover the empirical core of classical physics and to utilize it for the purpose of prediction and explanation eliminates just this possibility of universal application. We may use the concept of position and the corresponding more general concept of a particle only if certain experimental requirements are first satisfied. Many descriptive concepts are restricted in an analogous manner. The theory, therefore, cannot any longer be regarded as an account of a micro-level that exists independently of observation and experiment. It can only say what will happen if certain experimental conditions are first satisfied. It is incapable of giving an account of what happens in between experiments. It is nothing but a predictive device. Bohr's principle of complementarity gives a very striking intuitive account of the manner in which this predictive device works and in this way provides at least a partial picture of the micro world. The interpretation which we have just sketched was used now for making some important predictions concerning the future development of the quantum theory. The basic structure of the quantum theory, the use of formalism with non-commuting variables acting on a Hilbert space or a suitable extension of it, 
The corresponding intuitive feature of complementary aspects in the world are the result of analysis that has bared the observational core of classical physics. This structure, these features, are at last firmly based upon experience, and they are therefore final and irrevocable. We are here not presented, quote, with a point of view which we may adopt or reject according to whether it agrees or does not agree with some philosophic criterion, it is the unique result of an adaptation of our ideas to a new experimental situation, unquote, writes Professor Leon Rosenfeld of Copenhagen. It is, of course, uh, admitted that the quantum theory will have to undergo some decisive changes in order to be able to cope with new phenomena. And that physicist will be requested to introduce new concepts for the description of new facts. It is also considered legitimate to try different approaches and to develop different formalisms, such as choose S matrix theory for strong interactions, Heisenberg's unified field theories, and others. Nevertheless, it will be pointed out that however large these changes and however different these formalisms, they will always leave unchanged the basic elements just mentioned, which are in any case needed to give them empirical content. The future development, therefore, can only be in the direction of greater indeterminism and still further away from the point of view of classical physics. This attitude influences in an important way the evaluation of the existing theoretical problems of microphysics. It is clear that such problems will now appear to be minor puzzles, which do not necessitate a revision of the basic structure of the quantum theory. It is also clear that we have, in this case, the beginning of a new period of normal science. The science characteristic for a normal period, such as aversion towards different approaches in fundamental matters, are already present. Moreover, this normal period may well be expected to last forever. Previous crises were due to the existence of metaphysical ingredients in the basis of science. These ingredients have been removed. The further development will therefore consist in the gradual addition of new facts and the gradual erection of a tower of facts on a solid basis. Minor crises may still occur, but they will modify only the upper layers of the tower. They will not necessitate the recasting of the fundaments on which the tower rests. Now it should be quite obvious that the reasons given for such a prophecy are not at all acceptable. One of the main reasons given is that the indeterministic framework the idea of complementarity and its corollaries are an immediate expression of experimental effect. This does not put them into a unique position. Experiment transfers upon the laws used for its description an approximate validity only. Given a set of experimental results, it is therefore always possible to devise alternative sets of experimental laws which agree with them within the margin of error characteristic for the equipment used. The set of basic experimental laws defended by the orthodox is therefore only one set among many possible sets. Another argument given in defense of the point of view of the orthodox is that we need the descriptive terms of classical physics for expressing experimental results, and it is for this reason that alternative accounts are bound to fail. They might succeed in producing a formalism. However, in the attempt to give empirical meaning to the formalism, the classical terms will again have to be used and with them the point of view of complementarity. Now, as regards this argument, it must be noted that a new point of view will, of course, also have to provide new terms for the description of the observational level. It is quite unreasonable to assume, and this despite the fact that most contemporary philosophers of science believed this just to be the case, it is quite unreasonable to assume that observational terms possess greater stability than do theoretical terms. Observational terms usually are terms of some theory which have been applied under the most common circumstances and which have therefore become familiar. However, familiarity is not a guarantee of adequacy. Quite the contrary. It has been frequently found in the past that certain observational terms, such as, for example, the terms which were used in the Aristotelian physics, were inadequate and in need of replacement. The transition to the classical physics of Galileo and Newton would have been quite impossible without such a replacement. It is therefore possible to abandon a given observational terminology and to replace it by a different terminology. This, by the way, shows the absurdity in the argument of some contemporary physicists, notably Heisenberg and von Weizsäcker, which maintains that since physicists are endowed with a classical observational vocabulary, they will forever be unable to look at observable matters in a different manner. It is quite clear that an application of this principle at the time of Galileo would have given very great comfort to the Aristotelians. 
To repeat, it is possible to abandon a certain observational terminology and to replace it by a different terminology. But should we do such a thing? Clearly, the decision will depend on whether we have convinced ourselves that the terminology in use is inadequate. Only very fundamental difficulties could have sufficient persuasive power. It is therefore necessary for us to find out whether the present quantum theory is indeed faced with fundamental difficulties. Now it must be emphasized that the distinction between periods of crisis and normal periods does not help us to answer this question. This distinction describes the situation from the outside, as it were, and after scientists have made up their minds. The individual scientist, whose individual decision will contribute to the phenomenon which Professor Kuhn has described so clearly, cannot base his decision on what is a result of the decisions made. At this point, Professor Kuhn's book seems to suggest, though perhaps not in accordance with the intentions of the author, that the historical situation might provide a valuable guide, a guide, moreover, whose advice should not be neglected. It suggests that a period of crisis, as it were, announces itself by an accumulation of unsolved problems and by a feeling of general uneasiness and frustration, and that a separate analysis of the total theoretical situation by the individual scientist is not needed. And the attitude of many scientists is the same. This, it seems to me, means putting the cart before the horse. A mere accumulation of puzzles is neither necessary nor sufficient for creating genuine problems and for suggesting that what is needed is a basic revision and not only minor adjustment. At the beginning, Newton's astronomy was faced with an ever-increasing number of difficulties, but nobody, only very few people, saw in this an indication that Newton's theory was incorrect. The past triumphs of the theory, the new vision provided by it, the astonishing initial success, its fruitfulness, inspired sufficient confidence. The theory of relativity, on the other hand, was not preceded by an accumulation of difficulties. Most of the problems which can now be cited in favor of its invention had already been solved by Lorentz's theory of the electron. What Einstein was after was a general principle, comparable to the second law of thermodynamics, that could be relied on in the changes which seemed to surround the discovery of the quantum of action. He obtained his principle from fairly simple theoretical considerations, involving the symmetry property of classical mechanics and of classical electrodynamics, and he did not obtain it under the pressure of adverse empirical material. The further development led to the general theory of relativity. It is this new point of view which raises certain annoying puzzles such as the excess movement of the perihelium of Mercury into genuine problems and thereby precipitates progress. And it could not be otherwise. It must be repeated, it could not be otherwise. After all, an accumulation of experiments apparently incompatible with a certain theory will cease to be regarded as a challenge to calculation on the basis of the theory and will assume the appearance of a genuine new problem only if it is seen on the background of a new point of view that imposes upon it a coherence different from the coherence postulated by the established doctrine. The recognition of a problem as fundamental therefore depends on the development in addition to the received theory of a new point of view. This new point of view may of course be refuted by future research, but without it there is no chance of fundamental progress. Nor will it be possible to develop new points of view at once in a very detailed fashion. A vague metaphysical idea will in most cases be the starting point. The fruitfulness and the necessity for the purpose of progress of new points of view is confirmed, apart from these more abstract considerations, by many episodes in the history of the sciences, and especially by the history of the atomic theory itself. The exclusiveness of normal science. The strong moralizing adopted against the use of no points of view which deviate from the established modes of thinking is therefore self-defeating. If successful, such an attitude, which seems to be the prevalent attitude in the so-called Copenhagen School of Quantum Mechanics, will prevent the physicist forever from discovering the weaknesses of their favorite theory. It is also perhaps a little naive to suppose, as Professor Dirac did in a recent talk, that the more general or philosophical difficulties of a theory are of no importance for a physicist, and that the progress of physical theory will automatically dissolve them. The situation is just the other way around. Philosophical difficulties emerge from the comparison of a physical theory with general points of view, which have not yet been developed in detail and which are not in agreement with the basic principles of the theory. As we have pointed out above, such comparison is the motor which propels science 
and the solution of the difficulties created by it is necessary if we want to achieve not only a few minor adaptations or formal improvements, but fundamental progress. It is very important to repeat the standard ideology of normal science, viewed in the light of these considerations, turns out to be a hindrance of such progress. Theoretical pluralism should be encouraged and not frowned upon. It is only such pluralism and not the accumulation of puzzles which advances knowledge and which prevents it from becoming the perfectly embalmed corpse of what at some time was an exciting discovery. The consequence is, of course, that in science, unlike perhaps in politics, the battle cry should be revolution in permanence, and that the future of physics, and for that matter of any discipline that is capable of producing real discoveries, is a completely open matter that cannot be predicted in any interesting way. The talk which you have just heard, entitled Problems of Microphysics by Professor Paul Feyerabend of the University of California at Berkeley, is the last in a series on the philosophy of science. The forum staff is especially grateful to Professor Sidney Morgenbesser of Columbia University, coordinator for this series, for bringing together the distinguished philosophers who have spoken to you. And may we remind you, if you desire printed copies of Professor Feyerabend's talk, or indeed of the entire series, write to the forum editor, Voice of America, Washington, D.C. Until next week, then, at this same hour, this is William Reynolds wishing you goodbye from the studios of the Voice of America in Washington, D.C.